I'm Krista Corley, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Accessible Law, a publication of UNT Dallas Law Review. I'm here with Tressie Weeks and Chris Krupa Downs of the Weeks Law Firm. They're here to speak with us about the probate process and planning for a beneficiary or heir with a disability. Tressie, please introduce yourself. So I'm Tressie Weeks. I'm an attorney with the Weeks Law Firm. We help families with children with disabilities, and we help plan for the child's future. So we do specialized estate planning for those families, including special needs trusts. We also do regular estate planning and probate and guardianship. And I also have a nonprofit that helps families with children with disabilities. And then I serve on the boards of some other nonprofits that help people with disabilities. And so serving the disability community is not just a business for me, it's also a ministry. Well, thank you for being here. Chris, please introduce yourself. Well, my name is Chris Krippa Downs, and I'm an attorney with Tressy in the Weeks Law Firm. And I was a solo practitioner prior to joining her firm. And I focused on estate planning, a lot of probate, and a lot of guardianships. We had the opportunity to come in and work with Tressy and really help at our families that need guardianship and, and probate needs. And I also am a very active volunteer in community service organizations such as the Junior League of Collin County and many others. Well, thank you for being here. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the probate process? What is probate? Chris, I'd be happy to. Um, if you look at the word probate, it really can just mean to prove. And so the question becomes, what, what is it that you want to prove? And so you're either proving the validity of a will. So if an individual had a will written for them, they went to an attorney and they had a will prepared and it was properly executed, they were over 18 and they signed it and it had witnesses and formalities, it's asking the court to prove that that will is valid. Or it is asking the court to determine the heirs. So if an individual dies without a will or for some reason their will is actually defective and it's not going to be considered a will in the eyes of a court, you ask the court then to say who are the heirs and to determine the heirs. And then the second part of a probate is whether or not you're going to ask the court to formally appoint an executor or an administrator of the estate to handle the administration of the estate. Administration can be independent administration where you're going in and they're just being appointed by the court to act as that executor or administrator and then that administrator or executor is charged with collecting assets of the estate. They are going to pay debts such as funeral expenses, last bills, and then ultimately distribute the remainder of the estate to the beneficiaries or the heirs. Or you can actually have a dependent administration as well. And a dependent administration is more typical in an heirship proceeding, and that is more court supervised where the court goes along with you every step of the way and everything that administrator needs to have done, the court has to be approved. Um, ideally, uh, we prefer independent administration because the court is not mother. So if you think about the um, court as being mother, you don't have to go, mother, may I do something? And so that's really what probate is. It's sort of a two-step process, proving something and then doing an administration. Well, what is the difference between a will and a trust? So as we've already touched on, a will is a formal document where I might write a will where I say that I have left um, all of my assets to Tressie and I've also appointed her as the executor of my estate. I have done that formally. I've had witnesses. I've made my will self-proved where again I say in a paragraph that um, I'm 18, I know what I'm doing, who my heirs are, and it's a formal will. Um, and then that way, when I finally pass away, Tressie can take that will and utilize an, an attorney and take that through the probate process, ask the court to prove that will to be valid. Uh, but another option in estate planning is to consider the use of a trust. A trust is a tool where you have a trustor, also might be referred to as a grantor, and you have a trustee, and then you have a beneficiary. So if we take the case of just me, I could write a trust where I am the trustor, so I'm going to write a trust where I put my house and my bank accounts and all of my personal property into a trust. And then I can also be the trustee of that. So I would hold legal title to it. I would continue to manage that throughout my life. Trustee might be my successor trustee so that if I become sick or ill and lose some capacity while I'm alive, she could step in as trustee and manage all of that for my care and benefit because I can be the beneficiary of that as well. And then trustee, or maybe it's my kids or grandkids, can be the next level of beneficiaries. And with using a trust, I can also plan in 
some protections. So maybe I want it to be in trust for trustee's lifetime to protect it from any creditors that she might have or any, um, if she remarries to somebody, somebody in the future that her husband isn't um, taking part of my trust. So, and the thing I think maybe that lay people need to know is that trusts are more private. So when you do a probate and if I've written a will, even with an independent administration, that will becomes public record. I have to do an inventory as part of that administration, an inventory listing out what assets were in my estate, and that's on public record. Whereas if I have a trust, that, that can be private, and no one has to know those things. And there's still a will that comes along with the trust, but it's called a pour over will. And so it simply just says that anything I don't have in my trust pours over into the trust, and that can be probated if they need it to capture some asset I did not put inside my trust. Well, how is the probate process affected if an heir or beneficiary has a disability? Well, I think the one way that is impacted the most is that if you are that beneficiary and you are on a public benefit, if you are receiving Social Security supplemental income, if you are on Medicaid, those assets are what we call means tested. Your ability to have those is not based on uh, your workable hours um, that you might have had a job, it's really based on how much money you have. And if you have $2,000 or less in countable assets, you qualify for those benefits. But if that individual, that heir or that beneficiary inherits money, even if it's just a little amount from grandma in her will, they could be in jeopardy. They could lose that benefit and it could be very impactful to them to where they're losing insurance or the thing that they need to take care of them. So part of that probate analysis is always making sure that we understand the beneficiaries, whether it's in my will and it's naming Tressie, understanding does she have a need and if she inherits, is she going to be impacted? Um, so it's kind of critical to think about that when you're talking probate is looking at that big picture. So Tressie, what if parents did proper estate planning for their child with a disability? Sure, Krista. So if a, if a family is properly planning for their child, they're probably going to have what we call a third-party special needs trust. And this is a trust that the parents can create. And then when they pass away, what they leave to that child can go in that trust. And what's special about that trust is that it does not count against uh, that child for eligibility for SSI and Medicaid. So that means that the child can still receive SSI Medicaid and then the assets in that trust can supplement that. So the way the parent's money gets in that trust is the parents typically we do a will and they can leave that child share to that trust. But also for their IRAs and life insurance and things like that, we're going to name that trust as a beneficiary or a contingent beneficiary. So when the parents pass away, the money goes in that trust and then the impact, it doesn't impact their benefits. For a lot of these kiddos, Medicaid is a life or death situation. It can provide not only medical care, but it can also, uh, um, it can also provide in-home nursing care, supplies, diapers, um, home modifications, all kinds of things. And so for some children, if they lose those benefits, um, it could be very tragic for those kids. So when we plan ahead, we've got a third party special needs trust and the child can still be eligible. A third party special needs trust just means that when that child dies, whatever's left would go to whoever is named as a contingent beneficiary, if that's Chris or whoever that might be. So how is probate affected if the parents did not establish a special needs trust before their death? If they don't have a special needs trust, then when the parents die, if assets go to that child directly, as Chris mentioned, that child can lose their SSI and Medicaid. Now, if they lose SSI and Medicaid again, it could be quite tragic. Now, there in some situations, we can create a first party special needs trust. The difference with the first party trust is it has a Medicaid payback provision. So when that child dies, whatever's left is going to pay Medicaid back for whatever they've spent on behalf of that child for medical care. So in some situations we can create that, but the money can end up with the state. Now, if we have some new statutes in Texas, so if the assets were left to this child in a will or a trust, sometimes we can go to the court and have that will or trust modified to create a third party special needs trust. So in some situations we can salvage the situation a little bit, but if they have received these assets as a beneficiary of an IRA or life insurance, we can't go to court and have that beneficiary designation modified. 
So we might have to do a 1301 management trust or something like that, which may have some additional restrictions. So by not planning, they've really, um, they've put in jeopardy their child's welfare. So what can be done to address these concerns? Parents should consult with an attorney who's experienced in special needs planning and special needs trusts. So if they're looking for an attorney in this area, they can go to it. There are a couple of websites they can go to. They can go to, to the NALA website, which is the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, or they can go to the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Both of those websites have a listing of attorneys who are experienced in special needs trusts. And what I find is when the parents do the planning and they've done it right, they have a lot of peace of mind. And so I think it's a great thing for parents to plan ahead and get that peace of mind. Thank you so much for being here. You've given us a lot of great information and a lot to think about. For more information, visit the Accessible Law website.